Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this IT Live session. My name is Manuel Garcia. I'm the operations manager for the United States. Um, one of the, of the things that have been happening in IT is that in recent years, in the last two decades, basically, there have been a lot of frameworks and a lot of methodologies that have been adopted by different areas in IT. And all these uh, methodologies and frameworks have been necessary to improve the activities that the IT organization has been performing. And as we face uh, a, dif a different era, uh, a digital era or a digital age where a digital transformation of the business is required and much of that burden is carried by IT, all these frameworks and methodologies take a higher relevance for the success of the business. The challenge, however, is how we approach all these methodologies from a holistic perspective. Say, for example, a DevOps, a Scrum, ITIL for operations, COVID for governance, all these different frameworks have been valuable for many years for a specific purpose within IT. But now the challenge is how do we approach all this together from this holistic approach uh, in order to, to provide the, the value that the business needs in this digital transformation era that we're living in. And with this uh, purpose in mind, we have today's uh, speaker. And it is, I'm, I'm very honored to welcome Keith Sutherland. Keith is a good friend of mine. I have been uh, having the privilege to work with him for several years, and he's a very, very experienced guy, really a personality. We're very honored to have you here, Keith. Welcome. Manuel, thank you, sir. And welcome to everybody that decided to join us today. Uh, in just the last half an hour, Manuel did a post on LinkedIn, uh, again, promoting this session. And I responded with a comment that basically said, this session today will either validate the thinking that you may already have, or you never know, you might pick up a couple of nuggets here. So again, my name is Keith Sutherland. I'm one half of a company called Service Management Dyna Dy Dynamics. And you see there that it says co-founder and managing partner. For those of you that might be on the call that might know our company, you might know that my, my other, the other founding partner is Butch Sheets. Official name, Lauren Sheets, but, but he goes by Butch. And, and Butch and I have known Manuel and Global Links uh, to Manuel's point probably for at least about five years now. But let's get into it. I've got a few acknowledgments here because you know you have to pay homage to, to, to uh, different organizations for which you're using some of their material. But if you look at the first three bullet points, the first one represents my own company, Butch and I, uh, but we have a small consortium of consultants and educators. And one of those is Lisa out of Cornerstone and Bill out of BGB. But really, if you look at the rest of the bullet points there, Manuel used the term frameworks and standards and methods. And a lot of what we aspire to in our small group, especially in, in the consulting arena, is the convergence of these different approaches to help create outcomes for customers. At the end of the day, it's really about outcomes for customers. So you will see in our session today that many of these areas will come up. And that is not an exhaustive list by any means. I will action, actually mention some even beyond what we might show you on a slide. Again, this gives you some perspective that we are not really technology platform people as much as we are technology agnostic people. In some ways, you can say that we are process resources. Uh, because what we have realized is the technologies, the different technologies that we might use, no matter what it is, they are there to enable something else that we are trying to accomplish. So when you look at our team of, of, of four folks, we bring everything that you see on this slide, but there's one or two other things that we have some perspective on as well. So if you looked at the intro, what you're seeing on this slide is really the introduction to our presentation today. And I've highlighted some things in green. 
the first thing that I want you to know is that your speaker today, in essence, has dropped the letters IT off of the front of SM. We really see ourselves as service management resources. And for us, service management involves everything that you need to manage your service. That could be ITIL, it could be TOGAF, it could be, it could be uh, Safe Agile, it could be DevOps, it could be Lean. We believe that all of those, if you think of a honeycomb, are part of, even multiples of those at the same time, are part of creating outcomes for our market. And you can see your market as customers, users, and sponsors. Uh, people tend to have different language that they use at their company. Maybe they can, maybe, maybe uh, consumer supplies to the external market, maybe customer supplies to the internal market. It depends. And that's why we want the ability to adopt and adapt based on what the situation is. So if I say movement, think of DevOps as a movement. If I say ITIL or COBIT, think of, think of those as frameworks. If I say Six Sigma or CMMI or SDLC, think of those as, as methods. But there is a way for all of those as capabilities to work together in a harmonious situation. Unfortunately, and sometimes even I am a victim of, of, of this, especially if I'm looking at a hummingbird uh, outside my door here, I tend to, I might gravitate to that shiny object. And if you look at the third bullet point, one of the things that it's helping you to understand is sometimes we throw things out in favor of something else and I've seen it. And you might've heard the term throwing the, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I've seen it and you go to the new thing and then you realize, well, this isn't everything that I thought it was either when in truth, there really is some level of place for almost everything when it comes to creating outcomes for our customers. One of the things that I'm very, very pleased about, we are seeing a very big movement in our industry where CIOs are placing a stronger emphasis on the adoption of best practices. I think we saw several years where that kind of went away. But I can tell you every CIO that I am privileged to talk to today is absolutely promoting the use of best practices. One of the little funny things that it kind of reminds me of, and I go back many, many years in IT, you don't even want to know how far back I go, but there used to be a phrase out there called Nobody ever got fired for hiring IBM. I think when you look at the fourth bullet point today, that phrase has evolved to nobody's going to get beaten down for following best practice. But you have to make those best practices work for you and your organization based on what level of maturity you are today. So in today's discussion, service management is going to come up. Upskilling competencies and skills is going to come up. There are a lot of different things that are going to come up today. Design thinking, systems thinking. My real focus today is systems thinking. But nothing works within its own silo anymore. Everything is absolutely connected in some way. But at the same time, you may not need everything based on what the situation is. Manuel mentioned governance. That's one of the areas that governance comes in. I may hit on lean and value stream mapping today. Governance actually should dictate under what circumstances an organization might go down the road of value stream mapping. Let's keep going. So first, let's start with some very simple definitions. And one of the things that you will see me do in an upcoming slide 
is reverse the words service management to managing services and have a little bit of discussion around what's involved in managing services. Now, you may have heard the term SMO for service management organization or even service management center of excellence or even expertise or even having a service management practice at your company. Don't really care what you call it. What we really care about is what you get out of it. Are we providing value to customers? Because at the end of the day, it's an internal consultancy or how we're going to make that value happen through outcomes. Now, this term you've seen before or likely seen of or heard of. You've heard ITSM. Some people actually have in their, in their, in their enterprise service management practices a, a piece called ITSM or their technology. But very simply, that is focused on the IT side of things. And Manuel mentioned about how our market is moving and the concept of high velocity IT and digital transformation and agile thinking. So if you look at the definition, it said, if you look at the definition, it says strategic tactical operational approach. If you haven't heard the term yet, strategy ops. How's that for you? Probably fairly new. Strategy ops. Well, why do we say strategy ops? Well, in the digital transformation arena, your strategy could literally change more than once in a fiscal year. In that arena, that could happen. And what it wakes up is now, how do I operationalize my strategy at a strategic level? But this thing called ITSM has been around for a very long time. And at the end of that statement, I want to introduce maybe another term for you if you have not heard of it before. It is called XLA, which stands for Experience Level Agreements. It doesn't mean that SLAs go away. It just means that with SLAs, we're measuring the performance of a service. With XLAs, we're measuring the, the, the user or customer's experience with that service. Let's be really clear. You could have situations where you're meeting everything that you promised in an SLA, but you got customer and user communities that are still not completely happy. And it creates a credibility issue. So we're not saying that SLAs go away. You absolutely still need them, but they are complemented in a bi-directional way with experience level agreements. And if you haven't had a chance to do that, just Google XLA. There are tons of YouTube clips out there, and there are organizations that are absolutely focused with helping organizations like that. Now, one of the things that I'm excited about is, is this particular definition, because that absolutely wakes up digital transformation in a big, big way. What needs to happen now is IT resources have to start to realize that more and more IT resources might actually be embedded within business units. If you're familiar with the term a product team, dealing with user stories to create a new outcome for some particular group or market or industry, you got to understand that that's probably going to be a combination of IT resources and so-called business resources. And I say so-called because I believe IT resources need to be business resources as well. So you are absolutely seeing embedding IT resources and taking advantage of service management concepts, which is really what ESM is all about. So what I care about is service management, whether it's IT or whether it's enterprise. Digital transformation is really about the entire organization, not just the IT part. 
So I promised I was going to reverse those words, service management to managing services. And a lot of times what I do when I'm doing an, on, the, on the very beginning of a consulting engagement or even an education in, engagement, I will just take those words, service management, and reverse them to managing services and ask the group, tell me now what's involved in managing services. And if you don't want to think about it from an IT perspective, think about it from your favorite restaurant perspective or anybody that's positioned as a service provider, like even the quick oil change place. What's involved in managing the services? Well, you got to know who your market is. You got to know what your market values. That actually dictates what services that you should offer. And that can change over time because value changes over time. We need to have some idea on what demand for our services or products going to be because that's going to drive what capacity and how many resources and how many skills and all of that stuff. But I like the second bullet point from the bottom. How do we ensure continued value? Think of your stakeholder ecosystem. It's probably significantly large. And you got different stakeholders that bring different value perspectives, strategic value, financial value, economic value, operational value, technical value. And those different value perspectives for those same stakeholders, just because they liked it last year, doesn't mean they still like it this year's. And what that actually starts to bring up now is if this is who our market is, and this is what services we offer to that market to provide value, then what are the things that we need to have in our back pocket to ensure success, not only for today, but also ongoing? One of the things that I hope to leave you with in our session today is that you're never done. What's the phrase? It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a journey, right? And the journey is never done because the value proposition changes. Technology changes exponentially. Demand changes. Regulatory and legislative requirements change. Stakeholder and shareholder interests change. So this has to constantly evolve. It has to continually improve. And you'll see those themes come up. So before I get to systems thinking, the first thing that I want to talk about is design thinking. And there's kind of a picture of a path of design thinking. But let's define what design thinking is generally. And typically, if I'm doing a presentation, you can pretty well bet <clears throat> that I have spent a lot of time on research just to make sure that I am crisp and to validate my thinking. So the generally agreed description of design thinking. It's a method that continuously encourages users to define value. Now, the real message of today is systems thinking. But you don't do system thinking without looking at design thinking first, because system thinking is about the solution. What are we going to produce and how are we going to produce it? But we have to have some perspective of what that needs to look like. And the one really, really cool thing about design thinking is you notice that it has the word real in front of users there. And that could be users. It could be customers. It could be sponsors. But here's the bottom line. They have got to be involved from what we call soup to nuts. From the very first time that we discover the demand, and at the other opposite end of that spectrum is value realization. But what I'm talking about is not only those two points, but everything in between. 
So it says balance the concerns for all stakeholders. So we all know if you've been in IT for any period of time, the whole monodirectional approach no longer applies. We're using words like co-creation of value today. And there is no co-creation unless there's a fair amount of collaboration in place. And in order for collaboration to really work, we need to operate in a so-called safe environment where there's a strong foundation of trust. There is no fear of conflict. People are committed and they take accountability for their actions. But you got to understand, you got to have the right stakeholders in the room. How else are you going to balance the concerns? Now, I am a big fan of the term consensus. Doesn't mean everybody gets what they want, but everybody had a voice. And maybe you don't get it now, but maybe you get it downstream. That's part of the concept of continual improvement. You also got to consider economic aspects because you don't have unlimited resources. You don't have unlimited budget. So how is governance helping you prioritize? Let's give our practitioners, the people that are really going to benefit from the outputs that we create to generate their outcomes, let's give them the ability to contribute. And I will tell you, just even in the last couple of years, I've been at organizations where the IT people are nervous about IT activity going on in business units that they are not involved in. And I'm saying we got to get over that and we got to understand why that's happening. You've heard the term shadow IT and it's generally concerned, considered to be a negative term, but that's really where things are going. Especially as you think of product teams that have both technical resources and business resources involved. And maybe the leader of that product team is actually on the business side. We're trying to create better customer experiences. And I got to tell you, there's something to be said about being part of something that you actually end up using versus somebody gave it to you and said, just start using it. So that's really the message that I want to send about the design thinking part. Because now when we get to systems thinking, you're going to see that these things that we just talked about on this slide are absolutely an input to that. I was listening today, and I probably shouldn't bring up uh, uh, National Football League analogies. But if you look at what this quarterback, uh, Aaron Rodgers, from the Green Bay Packers has done, is he's created a situation where the organization has to insert him into the opinions and decisions that they're going to make going forward as a business. And he's just a quarterback of the team. Then I went on to hear that other organizations has done that in the past. And the funny thing that they said absolutely applies to the last bullet point here. That person that's working in the trenches is bringing something to this audience that they otherwise would not have known. And that's feedback. And one of my favorite phrases is, feedback is a gift. It's a gift. We ought to want all the feedback that we can get. So if you haven't heard of this thing called the customer journey, everybody and their mother is starting to use it now. And the two words out of this definition that I want to call to your attention are touch points and interactions. Touch point very simply is, how do they even know about you as a service provider? They may not be using your service or, or product at all yet. But the concept of a touch point is they might find out about you by walking by a storefront. They might find out about you by looking up something on Google. So there are touch points before and during the use of the service. Now, when we get into interactions, we're talking about that reciprocal activity that happens between all of the sides of the stakeholders. 
In other words, there's interaction between IT and business partners. There's interaction between business partners and suppliers. There's interactions between IT and suppliers. So interaction are those reciprocal things. And if I were to give you a little bit of a picture of it, right, I'm just going to build it out. Because the important thing is, if you think about systems thinking, different frameworks, standards, methods, movements, I'll bet when you look at these words, if I say explore or engage, you should be thinking about things like requirements. Well, DevOps and Agile have those. They just call them user stories. SDLC has those. They call them requirements. Project management has them. They call them requirements. Notice in those first two, in those first two chevrons, I've introduced DevOps and therefore Agile, project management, and really even ITIL. If I look at the offer, then I want you to kind of think what's going on in there is, okay, we went and looked at some things based on your requirements and user stories. We'd like to sit down with you and here's what we think we want to do. And subsequently get your agreement to that. So what could be involved there? Service level management, well, that comes from ITIL. Uh, uh, sharing, well, that comes from DevOps. Uh, architecting a solution, where that could be IT for IT, it could be TOGAF, it could be service-oriented architecture. Onboarding. What's, what's involved in onboarding, right? Now we're getting them onto the service. So think of transition activities. Think of the CI, CD pipeline in DevOps and Agile. There's, I'm only demonstrating, I'm still in, in design thinking, I'm only demonstrating that it will have an impact on systems thinking, which is coming up very quickly. Now, don't presume that co-creation is only happening at that point. Actually, co-creation has been happening since we entered Explore. The only point that they're making here is that once you go live, co-creation does not stop because you still got to deliver and support it. It just emphasizes that that keeps going. You keep watching. You keep learning. For next time, remember, feedback is a gift. And then the realize is the okay they are now getting the outcomes. What did I say earlier? If the right stakeholders were involved in this customer journey way up front, then by the time we get to realization, the expectations have already been set. They know what they're gonna get. And, and the really cool thing is, they were part of making it happen. They played a role in influence because they were part of collaboration co-creation, relationship management. Nice, let's keep going. So, so having talked about design thinking a little bit, and this is probably the busiest slide I'm gonna give you today, but it's got some quotes in it that I think are really, really cool. So the first thing that I want us to understand is that this is not a new concept. My research suggested that systems thinking really originated in 1956 by this person, Jay Forrester. He founded this group called the System Dynamic Group at MIT's Sloan School of Management, which of course you know has one phenomenal reputation in its industry. Let's look at some of these, what some of these folks have said. And I've given you the references here, and this, this session will be available for you. A holistic approach, that means big picture. Well, first of all, let me just kind of give you a favorite little quote that I found about systems thinking, because we're going to be talking about these combinations of frameworks, and that's coming up really quickly, like right after this slide. This combination of, of, of frameworks and methods and standards and movements. And I saw a quote and I couldn't find it here a couple of weeks ago when I was looking at it. But he said, because if you took and stacked up 
DevOps books, on top of project management books, on top of idle books, on top of site reliability engineering books, on top of COVID books. Man, you're going to have a pile of, of thousands of pages, literally. I feel so sorry for these folks coming in just fledgling out of college because they got a lot to learn before they can be really effective. Whereas over time, I've just been incrementally adding this capability to kind of what we do in our business. But I love the quote that goes something like this. It's not about the sum of the parts. It's about the interaction of those parts. So when it says a holistic approach to analysis that focuses on the way that a system's constituent parts interrelate and how they work together over time within the context of a bigger picture. Think of IT as just one part of a larger organization. And what they what really has happened here, if you look at what's what's in red, systems thinking is different from traditional analysis. Traditional analysis studies systems by breaking an individual system down into, into its component parts. Whereas systems thinking is about multiples of different systems and how the different parts connect it. It's just a different way or what I will call a higher level of thinking. Second major bullet, it's about seeing the results of our actions in a larger context. Now I will tell you, if you look up systems thinking, you will see that it's used a lot in problem solving. But at the end of the day, it's really about outcomes. Problem solving is one approach to outcomes. What if it's not something that already exists, it's something new, that's still an outcome I need to create and systems thinking can help you there. And I can't wait to show you a quote from Peter, but wait till I get there. So the difference between design thinking and systems thinking, understand the system is critical before you can create the design. It's helpful to apply this before designing the project, which is now co-creation, getting the right people in the room and start to whiteboard out what are the different things that might help us here. That's what they mean by apply systems thinking before actually starting to do the design because you can use this to consider which stakeholders will be most affected by your proposed project. And if you don't have the right, and y'all on this call probably know the time that you realized that you didn't have the right stakeholders involved. And I'll just capture it in two words. You realized it too late. Why didn't we ask? Why didn't we have them? Now, that does create an opportunity for improvement or learning, the so-called retrospective or lessons learned. But we would have liked to avoid that if we could have. By doing that, you can use their feedback. And I just love the fact of how, of how moving it is for people internally when we now have something and they were involved in making it happen, yet they were not the people that designed it. So, back in 2016, we did a presentation for the accrediting body for service management and Prince2 and PPM and P3MP, P B3M3, those are all from an organization called Axelos. And we talked about combining frameworks back as early as June 2016. And it's pretty interesting to me what's happened there. Now, if you don't recognize this particular picture, it really represents Idle V3 2007 and 2011 edition. And it was the so-called five phases of the life cycle, one of which was strategy, one was design, one was transition, one was operation, one was continual service improvement. And if you're not familiar with that, just think like this. Service operation included things like incident, problem, request. Transition included things like change, release, config. 
Design included things like capacity, availability, continuity, security. Strategy included things like demand, uh, finance, BRM, strategy management, right? And all of these things were connected. And, and as far as CSI, that was like the seven step improvement process. But the idea was everything was, was connected like you, like you see it on this picture. In fact, I nicknamed it the continuous complex closed loop system. I think I invented that. We did that presentation in 2016. This presentation, this is one of the slides. It's 2021, but here's what we did with it. We took those and we said, here are other things outside of ITIL that apply here. Here are other things outside of ITIL that apply here. Here are things outside of ITIL that apply here, here, here. All things that you've heard of. Now, as a result of governance, organizations have to decide back then and even now today, which of these things are we going to bring into our house and under what conditions will we use them? Because if you look at those closely, you see standards in here. Anything ISO you see is going to be a standard. Uh, PMBOK and PRINCE2, those are project management frameworks. Uh, you see PIMBA, I'm sorry, you see DevOps here, uh, an example of a movement. Architecture frameworks like TOGAF and Zachman that you would, would naturally associate with design. But you can also see that there is handoff and continued involvement. So not only do you see architecture here, you see architecture here because it was also always intended that the architecture people needed to be involved here versus just have stuff thrown over the fence to them. And my presentation today is largely about what you see here, but it's not new. And if I break these things down, like in this next picture, I'll just build it out. The, the general picture overall comes from ITIL, but I've introduced other frameworks and methods and standards in here. Check it out. Excellence in value creation, where we talk about the five different value perspectives. Strategy, finance, economic, operational, technical. There's project management. All oh, this is exactly how Prince 2, the project management framework, is laid out. COBIT for governance is part of strategy, because these are the same colors I use for those five books. Architecture stuff, there's agile. That could be safe agile, just like it could be SDLC. And then Agile, Scrum, DevOps, what do they really play day to day? And now that I've gone live, CICD, CICD. But they, notice that there was overlap. And continual improvement is supposed to look at all of it. Now, that was in place as long as five years ago or longer. In fact, V3 came out in 2007. So that's how long ago that was. But today, life is different. Today, life is different. Let's talk about today. So first of all, there's our quote from Peter. Peter Singe, vision without systems thinking ends up painting lovely pictures of the future with no deep understanding of the forces that must be mastered. You got to have skills and competencies. You not only got to bring those things in, somebody's got to truly understand that. Whether that understanding happens through education, through consulting, or a combination of both. Because that's what it's going to take to get you from here to there. So watch this. There's my term in the middle, managing services. Look at all the things that you could be using. Your honeycomb picture needs to be based on your governance practice. What makes sense for us? Because just because another company is doing site reliability engineering doesn't mean you're ready for it yet. And some of these are, in essence, duplicates of each other. You're probably not going to need ISO 20000 and COBIT. Probably not. 
you're probably not going to need TOGAF and IT for IT and service oriented architecture. Uh, if you see this thing over here called Verisim, that's something that's emerged in the last few years. And it's really service management for the entire business, if you go and look at it. And they are talking about the use of a combination of different frameworks and standards. There's project management. There's actually a framework by an organization called Business Relationship Management Institute that teaches people how to be good BRMs, even though IDLE talks about relationship management. There's the XLA stuff that I was talking about earlier. There's lean, if you've heard of value stream mapping, which is slated to be very, very big going forward starting this year in IT. But it's not only value stream mapping, it's also value stream management. There's Siam, if you're familiar with that. Ido talks about supplier management. So does DevOps talk about external providers. But here's a framework that focuses on, right, service integration and management. It's all about dealing with external providers. Now, this is not this is not an exhaustive list. It's not an exhaustive list. You don't see SDLC on here. Some people are still doing that. You don't see capability maturity model on here. Uh, so it's not exhaustive, but I wanted to give you enough to get your thought triggers going. Because to me, every IT service provider should have a picture like this that's relevant to them. Because as part of governance, what are we using to help manage services? And under what conditions do we use what? Value stream mapping is, comes from lean, which is all about continual improvement. But there are other continual improvement approaches outside of value stream mapping. How about SWAT? How about process assessments? There's so much out there that you got to make the right decision on what's going to give you the best chance to offer value. But there's one thing that you absolutely cannot forget. With all of this good stuff here, you can't forget about the culture and behavior of your organization. That absolutely has to be a component. Agile speaks very very succinctly to that, so does ITIL, so does DevOps. One of the DevOps principles is sharing. Well, you got to have a collaborative environment. It's great to automate stuff, but what if you can't get people on board with it? ITIL, big undertaking. You, know, you probably don't need all of it. You probably only need some of it. So in order to pull this off, you're going to have to have the right skill sets and competencies. And if you haven't heard of T model, Pi model, and Comb model resources, notice that for all three of them, the horizontal line is the same, but the vertical line is different. And that comb shape, it should look like a comb, but all of the tines in the comb don't have to be the same same length of verticality. In other words, this could be cut in half. You still know something about whatever that area of specialization is. This could be a person that just knows COVID. This could be a person that knows that knows COVID and DevOps. This could be a person that knows lean, COVID, ITIL, DevOps. One of the things that CIOs are not only after best practice, they're also after being more agile. And the more people that you have that bring pie shape and comb shape capability to your organization, the more you're able to get to market quicker, which is an agile concept. If I have eight people on a scrum team and they all have four different skill sets, when I'm saying you, I'm bringing 20 to 30 skills across eight people, and those eight people are now going to do a sprint. And based on the knowledge that they bring to the table, we're going to get to market faster. And I absolutely expect in a CIO strategic plan to see words like being more nimble and more agile. But I'm here to tell you, folks, 
We're seeing that language in CEO strategic plans now. And if you think about it and you think about the term business case or business value plan, we now have the justification to spend. If we can promise on the back end, we're going to meet our strategy better. We're going to have a better ROI. We're going to be able to do more with less. Oh, those are different value perspectives. So you talk to each stakeholder based on what it is that they value. But that means you got to spend time learning about them and then about you. And that's one of the things that co-creation of value is all about. So I'm coming to a wrap for today. And I could talk all day about any of these subjects. That's really kind of what we do in our business. I've already explained this to you. But very quickly, when I first came into IT, I came in as a mainframe computer operator on third shift. That's where I started. But over time, I learned about other stuff. When distributed environments came in, it was no longer the mainframe world. Now I got to know about mainframe and distributed environments in the data center. I had 31 years of data center background. But what I'm doing for you today, I've been doing since 2004, and I absolutely love it. And I think what enables me is 30 years around data centers and plowing through all of these books, but also having great passion because I've seen it, what life looks like when you have these things in place. And I've seen what life looks like when you don't have them in place, and it's not pretty. So I've explained the difference between these three. There actually is one called the V model person. I haven't looked at that one yet, but I understand there's a couple more beyond what I'm presenting to you today, but you get the drift. So very quickly, there is something in idle version four called the value system. And you're gonna see where this applies here. We talked about governance and the importance of it. I'm going to get into the value chain in a second, because the whole idea here is we got a customer with an ask, a requirement, a user story. How do we get them to value realization as quickly as possible? And just before that word value, there needs to be a product or service that's enabling that value. But governance is going to be key. Practices, those things that we will do to help us, relationship management, continual improvement, uh, service level management, change enablement, problem management, whatever. You're going to use those based on what type of opportunity or demand it is. And think of opportunities as disruptors or innovations. Think of demand as something you already have, but you have to make it better generally how we explain it, but we should always have continual improvement. What's the term? Perfection is, is often sought after, but rarely achieved. You still need to try to get better. If you know the definition of the word Kaizen or Kaizen, however you pronounce it, small incremental improvement. It's still better than it was yesterday. So I changed the look and feel of the picture in ITIL a little bit, but it's still their stuff. And if you notice now with my arrows, those things are totally integrated with each other. It's like a smooth running machine. But what I'm here to tell you is that for every one of these, I didn't even talk about the guiding principles, but if for every one of these, there's some, there's some standard or framework or movement that helps you with that word. So this thing in the middle, this value chain, that's referred to as the operating model. So just as my last bit of demonstration, I'm just going to build it out for obtain and build. I want you to interpret the word build as development. That could be DevOps. It could be safe, agile. It could be SDLC. For, for design and transition, on the design side, that could be TOGAF. It could be, it could be uh, IT for IT. It could be service-oriented architecture. If you want to go way back, it could be Zachman. Transition, think of release. So now think of the CI, CD pipeline. So that's DevOps. Planning, 
Idle has a, has a lot of time that it spends on strategy. There's a class right now today called DITS Digital IT Strategy, which is an absolute brutal class, but it's about transforming the business, digital transformation for the business. And as far as delivering support, well, well, DevOps has a perspective on that. Lots of tools in the DevOps tool chain that help you do day-to-day -day support. Idle has incident, problem, change, request, event management. So you could almost have a picture like this and from each one of those main words spin out to some particular framework or standard or movement or method. And in essence, that is my presentation for today. Systems thinking is a way to investigate factors and interactions that we've talked about that could contribute to a possible outcome. That's what it's about. If there's any word that should be bolded and flashing in red, it's the word outcome. A mindset more than a prescribed practice system, systems thinking provides an understanding of how individuals can work together in different types of teams. So don't forget, you got to have the required skills and competencies. You can't forget about culture. Collaboration and feedback loops are critical. Adaptive thinking is key. As soon as you hear, that's not how we do it here, you know you're in trouble. I want to thank you for listening to me. I'm going to turn things over to Manuel. Very interesting, Kid. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. Um, there's one question here, very interesting question. Where do we start? Like, you know, there are many things to do in IT, many things to support the business. How do you prioritize what is more important than what? I am a big fan of the CI model, which starts with, especially if you got to go down the road of business cases, it starts with where is your company going in its business? If you're familiar with the CI model, the first step is where are you going? That comes down to vision, mission, goals, objectives. The next step is where are you now? Because you, now you got to understand if you're the provider, where do you stand against that? And there's different approaches that you can use to help with that. Process maturity assessments, you can do a, a SWOT analysis, uh, you can do, uh, uh, you can bring in the COVID assessment framework. There's all kinds of things. So that was step two. Step one, where are we going? Step two, where are we now? Step three, what are we shooting for? We like this, this concept of, of key results and KPIs. Then it's okay. What's my plan to get from where we're going from where we are? Now let's execute that plan and let's look at the data and bear in mind, we're not gonna get it over done overnight. And that's why the last step is keep the momentum going. You just keep going around that circle. And the idea is every time you go around that circle, you'll get a little bit better than you were before. And I am a strong believer in crawl, walk, run. You can't go faster until you got enough of those skills and competencies and you've looked at the data and you can validate that's where we are. And don't forget, it's not about the squeaky wheel getting the grease. It's what's important to the organization. And that's where the word outcomes comes in. Value, outcome, cost, and risk. So-called VOCAR. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. And one final advice for those IT professionals that want to prepare for the future. You know, we know that uh, these frameworks, these standards and methodologies will keep evolving and more will be born possibly. So what, how, what is the best way for an IT professional, for an IT manager, or even a non-manager, but someone in IT, to prepare on how to best use all these frameworks for the sake of value delivery, business value delivery? So, so here's, here's, here's the initial thing that comes to mind uh, for me for that. Uh, I am a fan of the so-called College of Lifelong Learning. And what I mean by that is things stay, one of the things that used to frustrate me, uh, you know, there's a lot of risk of own, owning your own business, but there's a lot of reward too. 
And the one thing that I will tell you is that I was a practitioner inside of a company for many different types of companies. I've worked in manufacturing, healthcare, banking and finance, customer service. I've been very, very blessed. But I've worked some places where it just hasn't been fun. And one of the reasons that it wasn't fun is typically if your organization is not performing well, one of the first things that gets cut is so-called operational expense. Can't go to the conference this year, sorry, don't have the money. Uh, can't go to training this year, sorry, don't have the money. And I gotta tell you, if you do that for two, three years running, you find out that you're behind the curve in your competencies and skill sets. So one of the things that I, there's today in the digital arena, there's no reason that you can't learn. If I think of DOI, they have something called, the, I'm sorry, the DevOps Institute, they have something called DevOps Days. And it's free. Or somebody, because who we want to talk to are people that are like us or like practitioners or going through some of the same things. And maybe they've been there and done that. And maybe there's some things that we can learn. But I think you got to lay out your plan based on who you want to be when you grow up and you want to execute that plan. But the way to execute that plan is you got to stay on top of the changes in the market. You folks have no idea. I get 100 emails a day. I get the hundred and I don't unsubscribe because sometimes there's nuggets from CIO magazine. Sometimes there's nuggets from the DevOps Institute. What the heck? Sometimes there's nuggets from global links. And if you miss that stuff, you might have missed an opportunity. So to me, it's about the college of lifelong learning. Before we started today, Manuel was asking me how many years I've been in IT and I didn't almost want to tell him because it establishes me, number one, as a dinosaur, but number two, look at how much learning that I have brought to this presentation today. When you've been a victim, believe me, you will always learn more from things going wrong than you ever do from them going right. Agile, fail fast. I, I, Manuel, those are my initial reactions to that question. Makes sense. Totally makes sense. Thank you very much, Keith. And you mentioned something very important. Plan who you want to be tomorrow or in the future. And this is something that, and I will take this opportunity to promote uh, Global Links' workforce development ecosystem that we are launching. And this initiative, IT Live, is actually part of that. We want to help companies prepare for the skills and the talent that their people will need in the future through our workforce development ecosystem. We're bringing a lot of partners on board. Keith is one of our partners. All the experts that we have in these IT Live sessions are partners of that ecosystem because we want to provide companies with a plan to help them build the capabilities their people are going to need in the future. So that's what we have. Uh, the IT Live is part of that. We are going to launch a platform for the ecosystem. So stay tuned in uh, our future IT Live sessions because we will provide more details on that. So hey, Manuel. That Keith, please. Yeah. Manuel, one thing if I could add to that. Uh, Manuel, you've met our small team of people. And, you know, together, I think we are pretty powerful. And I think we can go up with any four from any other organization. But here's my point. We are very fortunate to be so small and to have the privilege to work with really big global organizations. And to the point that you just made, many of those big global organizations have bought in Workday and using it for HR. And many of them, many of them are using, um, uh, they're looking at wanting to badge their people for skill sets and competencies so that they can serve their business better for tomorrow. In other words, if this is going, who do we have that might be able to help us with that? And I am seeing a big movement around that. And some of them might be taking slightly different spins, but at the end of the day, it's over. It's about include in improving skill sets and competencies. And I think that what you just described is all over that. And that's absolutely what reminded me of what I just said. Exactly. Exactly. Totally makes sense. And as, as technology keeps evolving and business needs keep changing, the capabilities and the skill sets of people will need to evolve as well. We're hitting the one hour mark. Thank you, Keith, for such a good presentation. It's been an honor having you here and stay tuned for our next IT Live session. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, follow us on social networks, stay tuned for our workforce development ecosystem. Thank you very much, everyone, for being with us today. Thank you all.
I am surely privileged. Thank you, Keith.